الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أيها الأخوة أحييكم بتحية الإسلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وعليكم السلام ونسأل الله تعالى أن يغفر لنا ذنوبنا ويكفر عنا سيئاتنا وأن يدخلنا في جنة النعيم نسأله بعلم نافع ورزق واسع وعليه نتوكل وإلي و... وعلينا نتوكل وعليه نتوكل عفوا وإليه المسير ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Praise be to Allah. We praise Him. We seek His forgiveness, guidance, and His mercy. We ask Allah to give us beneficial knowledge and understanding and wide sustenance. Amen. And to, on Him we depend, and to Him is our return. We send peace and prayers on His final messenger, Muhammad. So, uh, last time, if you remember, we continue. I said I would discuss a few important ahadith to do with the context of uh, basically re social relationships in society because we're talking about still we're at the juncture of Medinan society and the constitution that was put together or the Sahifa in Medina uh, giving the rights and obligations between believers and also rights and obligations in regards to others especially Ahl Kitab in Medina. So in relation to that, that's why we're looking at our context of society and there are a few pertinent hadith on top of what I've already said about wilaya, which is allegiance in contrast to friendship, what the Quran says about that, etc. And some of the misunderstanding and misinterpretations that come from that. And in regards to the issue of trust, for example, we talked about that. And basically our interaction with non-Muslims in a society context of where we live, where we're not, not at war, in fact we have a contract and that Ahad has to be kept uh, uh, in peaceful times. It's a totally different situation as I've said many times to the Ayad which apply to war situation and that is when war has been declared on us and war has been declared on us as a, a state, not as individuals. As individuals we have a different approach uh, which is the best approach um, and of course there's a the law of the land as well. So there's enmity on a personal level, but war being declared on a state level, which brings out the area to do with warfare. And they're not, they cannot be applied, or I should say misapplied, to the situation of peaceful times when people of different religions uh, have lived in Muslim society, although that's not the evidence because evils and other things can be done in Muslim history as well. That's not an evidence I'm giving you. The evidence is there in the Quran and the Sunnah anyway, which we've deliberated on before. Tons of evidence from Quran and Sunnah about good relations. And uh, most of all, the ayah I've mentioned, which summarize it beautifully, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Surely Allah has ordered justice and ihsan. And we talked about ihsan before as well. Wayyitha'ithul qurba wal yatama wal masakin. So, just carrying on on that, in regards to um, good relations with the community, with neighbours, with non-Muslims, uh, in all walks of life, including uh, greetings, etc. There's an issue, because there's a hadith in Sahih Muslim, which has caused issues for some people, including some Imams as well in their behavior with non-Muslims. This hadith in Sahih Muslim uh, is reported where the Prophet ﷺ says, La tabda'ul, la tabda'ul yahuda wa nasara bis salam wa idha laqeetumuhum fi tariq fattarruhum ila adyaqih So here, the hadith in Sahih Muslim that the Messenger of Allah said that do not initiate the Salam with the Yehud, the Jews and the Christians. It doesn't just stop there. And when you meet them on the way, then فَطَّرُّهُمْ إِلَىٰ أَدْيَقِهِ Push them towards the narrow path, meaning to the 
roadside. So those who have seen take this hadith, including uh, some imams as well, they practice the first part of it selectively. They don't say salam to them. Some of them don't even reply to the salam of a Christian or Jew at work or a non-Muslim who says salam alaikum. They go like that. And they, of course, noticed it. So they mentioned to a colleague of mine and others, why is it that when we say Islam, they just go, mm -hmm. why don't they say Islam to us? Why don't they say Wa alaikum Islam? Or why don't they never say it to us? Yeah. And especially in a situation when a Christian or a Jew, I mean, it's not unfamiliar for them. It's in the Bible anyway, Shalom. And <laughs> it's, it's there already from there. So especially those people, if they say it, and if somebody realizes it from Muslim, my, my practice manager at work, for example, is not Muslim. He knows that we Muslims kept on saying Islam in front of him. We have secretaries who say Islam, we doctors say. So he used to say it sometimes, not every time, good morning, other time. When he said Salaam Alaikum, I don't know. He said, Walaikum Aslam. Nice day. He <laughs> said, Peace be upon you. Yeah. So, now, what I saw practice of this, which is interesting, is that you take the first part of the hadith and you try and practice it. So, ah, look, it, Prophet say it's haram, we're not allowed to, we're not, we're not allowed to initiate. Respond actually doesn't even come from there. So there are some who say we're not allowed to initiate. But then I said to them, why are you being selective in taking part of the hadith then? I haven't seen you practice the rest of the hadith. So every morning when they say salam, or don't say salam, say good morning, don't say salam, then also, when they go by, you should push them towards the wall. So, if you want to follow the full hadith, it's there. Why do you pick that part and leave the other part? Because they don't, they don't feel it's right to follow that part, do they? That's why they're doing it. But on what basis do you reject that part and not practice it and take the first part? To keep your job? You see what I'm saying? It needs understanding. So, take the full thing. So let's be clear first that this hadith is the full hadith. It didn't come in two parts and we have to first check is it authentic. It's in Sahih Muslim which means there's a very good chance it's authentic. Yeah. And, uh, and this second part is not an idraj, idraj, which means it's not been inserted from a, a weak narration somewhere. It's also part of the hadith. So we say it's authentic. Now we look at the situation of the Quran. And this is the way of ulama, great muhaddithin and ulama. They didn't just take the hadith and say, now you have to try and understand it. And also compare to the Quran. Look what Quran is saying. وَإِذَا هُيِّتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا As I mentioned in the Jum'ah Khutbah. When you are greeted with a greeting, then greet with a better greeting. Yeah? Return with a better greeting. So if they say, Assalamu Alaikum, this is general. They don't say with Muslim. Then greet with Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah, peace and mercy of God be with you. Yeah. So if you say if they say good morning, say good morning, how are you? You know, at least say good morning or duha. So the Quran came with that uh, aspect. But that's a general comment. Then the Quran came in areas, various places, where it talks about salam being initiated by believers with disbelievers and Muslims. For example, for example, Ibrahim when he, when he left his father, he left him with Salaamu Alaikum by saying Salaam to him. It's quite clear his father was Muslim, he was throwing him out. He was actually threatening to kill him. So the Quran mentions Salaam from Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam. Also, Allah SWT in Surah Al-Furqan, Allah SWT says, Surah 25 And when the jahilun, the ignorant people, they address you, yeah, say to them, Salam. Salam. So who's initiating it? Not the jahils. What does jahilun mean here? Jahilun actually is not because they're jahil. So as an ignorant person, Salam alaikum. <laughs> no. What does it mean? It means that they are behaving in a jahili way. They are being abusive with you, nasty, yeah, argumentative over, and maybe filthy. Yeah? So, 
Don't get involved. Salaam alaikum. So it could be a believer, can it? But it could be a disbeliever. And more likely, jahilun is used in the Quran for who? Disbelievers. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah 28, verse 55, When you hear, uh, when they hear, talking about believers, so it's describing believers when they hear lahu. Lahu is any kind of useless, futile talk. It doesn't mean that if somebody's talking about the weather and you say this is a waste of my time. No. Lahu means negative, you know, bad talk, filthy talk. Somebody's insulting or even backbiting actually, which many Muslims do. <laughs> it includes that, definitely. So all the things under lahu, some people say music. There's no evidence it applies just to music, yeah? But it can apply to music if it's filthy songs that are, uh, 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 mixed with uh, naked dancing and filthy words. Then it applies there as well. But here he's talking about really uh, that kind of chicha and uh, that kind of atmosphere and environment where filth and wrong is being spoken of or done. So when they hear that, anhu, they turn away from it. And they say, Lana a'malana wa lakum a'malakum. Our deeds are with us and your deeds are on you. Meaning you're responsible for that. We're responsible for our deeds. That's why we're turning away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A'mal, uh, a'mal. Salamun alaykum. Salam on you. Who's initiating it? The people involved in law. Yeah. Believers or disbelievers. They're not initiating it. So the believers are saying, Salamun alaykum. La nabata gil jahileen. That tells you it's kuffar again, because jahileen is used. La nabata gil jahileen. We don't want to get involved in this jahli kind of ignorant practice or ignorant behavior that you're up to. Assalamu alaikum. Quran is saying it. Quran is saying it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also uh, in the end of Surah Zukhruf. In Surah Zukhruf, Allah SWT ends with وَقِيلِهِ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ هَؤُلَاءِ قَوْمٌ لَا قَوْمٌ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ فَاسْفَحْ عَنْهُمْ وَقُلْ سَلَامٌ فَسَوْفَ يَعْلَمُونَ Allah SWT is saying in the Quran here and it is said وَقِيلِهِ It is said to him, or said to Allah, Ya Rabbi, O oh our Lord, O oh my Lord, surely these are a people who are disbelievers. La yu'minun. Yeah? فَاسْفَعْ أَنْهُمْ وَقُلْ salam. So Allah is responding. فَاسْفَعْ أَنْهُمْ Overlook. Forgive them. فَاسْفَعْ أَنْهُمْ From Safaha. Yeah? وَقُلْ salam And say salam. Say salam. As an order. فَاسْفَعْ أَنْهُمْ all right, means forgive them, overlook what they what they're doing. Disbelievers, la yuk biul it say in the ayah before. So we know what we're talking about. Disbelievers, wa qul salam and say salam. Fa sofa yaglamun. So soon they will know. They will know the truth. So meaning when death comes. So you see here the ayat what they're talking. <laughs> the clear ayat of the Quran showing initiation and ordering and commending of saying salamu alaikum. And describing believers doing that with juhal and kuffar. So we have to understand the hadith with all that. Now do we take, where do we take the hadith? If you take the direct meaning of the hadith, zahir, without any context, we have to reject the hadith. Don't we? And if I bring all the other ayahs of how to do da'wah and deal with people who are not believers, believers or not disbelievers, about about being good and showing ihsan, well, pushing them into a wall or on the street is not ihsan, is it? Yeah. So we have two choices. One, to find the problem. Is there a problem in this hadith? And sometimes this is how ulama of hadith did. They looked at the Quran as a criterion and the 
the chain of the hadith appears appears at first stage authentic. So there's another level, they called it Naqdil Khafi, finding the hidden illa or problem with the hadith. Yeah. And one of the tools they used was the Quran. If it came like that with the Quran, there must be a problem with the hadith or with our understanding, we didn't put it in its right place. Yeah. In this hadith, majority didn't find another problem with the hadith. There could be still, because it's so strong the Quran in regards to what appears to be opposition. But the best way to understand it, really, is to apply that to a situation of warfare again. Other times, there's disagreement with disbelievers. They're talking rubbish or they're abusive, etc. But you say, Salaamu Alaikum, I'm not going to this, we won't get drawn into this. But in warfare, different situation. Yeah. When there is enmity going on and war going on, that's the best way to understand. Then you don't go around with people who are your... Uh, who are traitors with, this is what we talked about before, Munafikin were used in alliance with these people who were working with the outside forces against. Yeah. So if there's warfare with Christendom, yeah, it's warfare. it doesn't mean the Christians in your city you're treating like this, it's those who are enemies, yeah, shown to be enemies. Yeah. So that's the way to understand it, that's the best way if we accept the Hadith. But there is a, if we don't see if there's a problem even with that, then the hadith has to be rejected from the Qur'an. That's the only two ways to approach this hadith. You follow me? It cannot be applied in Britain, this hadith. You cannot pick... If you want to apply it, apply all of it. And I'd like to see what happens when you apply it. What kind of dawah you'll be doing. Can it? It cannot be. Right? So, there's only two ways. One is, it's in a war situation, uh, uh, and the other is it has to be rejected. That's the way to deal with this hadith. Because it counters, the, it counters so much from Quran and Sunnah about good relations with people. Yeah? Citizens especially. <laughs> yeah, even if they're not citizens. If you're travelling abroad with wayfarers and strangers, and those who have given you security, those whose country you visit as a guest, you're not going to behave like that with them. Yeah, Muslims or Jews. So that's the, 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 the best way to look at this. And I mention it because it, it, it is an issue for some people. And they will raise this and say, oh, yeah. Whereas, also the Prophet starts in authentic hadith said, in all uh, nas in dallahi man bada abis salah. That the, the, the first and foremost of human beings before Allah are the ones who begin the Islam. Don't we teach that? That the one who says Islam first has more reward, don't they? Yeah? And that applies. It doesn't say with Muslims, <laughs> by the way. There's nowhere where it says with Muslims. So again, that comes to counter that good character and behavior from this which comes in this hadith. You ask I wonder if there's any other context in the Prophet Peace be one meant that, because did he practically did himself like Good point. Pushing no evidence he ever did anything like that. Can you imagine the Prophet Sallallahu pushing somebody in, on the, in the corner to the side of a street because they were Christian or Jew. Now the villain. So it puts a big question mark, even though it's in Sahih Muslim. Yeah. And there's the evidence I mentioned in, in the Quran, very direct. Um, so as far as a situation, and I'll come to a, a few other hadith which are to do with Jews and Christians, which are interesting and very important. Um, so, when we took a, talk about relations, we talk about friendship, that there was nothing against that. Yeah? In fact, there'd be an encouragement for friendship, for, for showing the good behavior. Neighbor, neighborliness was not for just believing neighbors. It was for neighbors. And for neighbors in Islam and Hadith about neighbors, and the Sahaba said that so much was stress was put on neighbors, we thought an inher inheritance was going to be given to them. Yeah. But, and and in, in and neighbours we have to understand, not in our context of the next door neighbour on the right and left, but neighbourhood actually. So we have neighbourhood watch and all this, that was the idea, the neighbourhood. It means that kind of relationship with the neighbourhood, not with a terraced house on the right and left. Yeah, they didn't have terraced houses in those days, so it was your neighbourhood. Yeah. So all that kind of 
encouragement for dealing uh, good with neighbors, which we're very bad at doing. I speak for myself. We're all very bad at doing it. You know, and I, and I still say this, and I, I remind the khutbah, and I will continue to do so, the best counter, the best counter to all the rubbish on internet, on the news and everything, is personal touch. And if we just began as Muslims with one or two people, families in the neighborhood, we will change them. That's what, because it affects the heart. News is fact. Talks are just fact and argumentation between the Christian and the Jew, uh, a Christian and the Muslim, or a Jew and a Hindu. They're just fact-finding and debate. But it's touching the heart what this re what it's really about, isn't it? This is about character. Islam came for that character, real care. Yeah, and we get our real care for humanity and the environment because of our iman. It's not superficial care. It's not tick box care. Yeah, like society has become now, lots of things is tick boxes. Yeah, am I ticking the boxes? In many professions, isn't it? Yeah, health and safety is tick boxes. Not because you care for the people, is it? Because you might get fined. So that's why I'm, I'm saying it because sometimes Muslims in Dawa, we become like tick box, tick box people. We don't really care for them. We just want a few more Muslims so we can shout Allahu Akbar and then say, all right, you know, on your bike. That's how we do it. So what I mean by it is that genuineness, that's Iman, is the genuineness love and care for humanity. Yeah. And not being judgmental, therefore. Uh, uh, that's, you know, bad people, we don't like the bad, of course, and we have to protect our families from the uh, bad as well, that's true. But don't still deal with them in a bad way, in a better way, in a good way, to show them the, uh, the way. So, in that uh, society sort of interaction, social relationship, as I said before, involves all those kind of things come into play. Yeah, and therefore people who asked about, uh, are we allowed to uh, celebrate with Muslims like a birthday, etc. Are we allowed to go to their funerals, etc.? There's nothing to stop that really, because a, a birthday is not a religious thing anyway. Yeah. Of course, if a birthday involves disco dancing and alcohol flowing and things, well, we don't go. Not because it's a birthday, but we go because of what they're doing. Yeah? And, um, and we don't partake of that. Um, Funerals, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed respect for humanity. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, famous hadith, you may have heard of that, uh, uh, certainly, that uh, a funeral was going by. Prophet Sallallahu sat with the Sahaba and he stood up out of respect. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, it is the funeral of a, a, a Jew. He said, is he not a human being? Subhanallah. Is he not a human being? So the Prophet Sallallahu standing up. There's a different debate later on with ulama that came uh, about standing or sitting for funerals going by, that, nothing to do with believers or disbelievers. This is a debate that took place because at one time Prophet Sassam funeral was going by and he, and he was sitting. So some said, oh, he used to, used to stand up, then he sat down. Others said, no, which is, I believe, the best opinion, that it's fine to sit and it's fine to stand, but recommended to stand from the behavior of Sulu Allah. Is there anything? In the hadith uh, that you know of, where the Prophet or the Sahaba celebrated, well, you know they celebrated their own birthday, but other birthday people, people must have celebrated birthdays and that No. Nobody so did. Nothing about. No, nothing, not about celebration, but, but mention they, of it. They went to birthday parties. Mention of it. Mention of it. Because it's left, Ulama say it's left to culture and orf. Orf. You they don't make it religious. It. If you make it religious, then it is a bid'ah. Like they do the, um, um, the milah. Yeah, you know I've given a yeah, yeah, khutbah on that, so I don't want to repeat that. But the point here... the majority of the people that do this milah, they yeah. all do their own birthdays and happy parties and all the rest of it, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because they say, look, if we do our own, why should we do... Yeah. I mean, you've heard what I said about milah. Yeah. I think the balanced message of milah is, does it, we have to separate the, the, the importance of that occasion, and there is some importance given to the birth of the Prophet and his death date, and the Hijrah, etc., as I mentioned to you before. But the issue is how we celebrate it, certainly with Rasulullah because there's a danger of it becoming a religious issue. And some made it a religious issue, for that the ones who don't celebrate it, they actually look down on them, yeah, and say negative things. So that's when it becomes wrong. 
But other things in life, celebrating birth, it's not a religious issue. It's a culture issue. And as long as we don't mix it with the religion, it, it becomes under the category of mubah. Mubah means it's just culture. Yeah? Culture, doing it, not doing it. Other things we do in culture as well. Yeah? As long as they're not religious or against the religion, there's no problem with it. It's different how you then change it. I mean, uh, a, a birthday sometimes can be too much about me, 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 parents, it's all for me. So you can change it. And, you know, uh, our children used to get us parents a gift on, the birth, on their birthday. <laughs> but still remember it. Yeah. Uh, so encouraging sharing with others and things like that. You know, that, that, that's another way of looking at it. But anyway. So, um, interaction, social interaction, these are the kind of things, you know, is it religious, is it not religious, does it involve me doing anything? That's why Alama, even Sheikh Dush said decades ago, he was the, the, the main Imam, a great scholar actually, Rahimahullah, uh, may Allah mercy on him, who was the Imam of London uh, Central Mosque. <coughs> and I used to talk to him on a regular basis and uh, we had some wonderful sessions with him. Uh, we're talking about back in the 80s uh, and alhamdulillah he'd lived here for some time so I had really good understanding but it was well established uh, traditional uh, understanding and alim well known around the country even in those days he was Sheikh Tars. so uh, for example about attending a funeral of non-muslims etc he give uh, or weddings and things especially non-Muslim families, or if you've got extended family, or even friends and things. How you behave in that, in regards to not joining in the service, how you can stay behind at the back of the church, not joining when they're joining, obviously. So these kind of things, uh, which would uh, uh, avoid being part of the religious ceremony. Yeah, And the issue of making dua for disbelievers, family, etc., I discussed before with you when we talked about Abu Talib, so I'm not going to repeat that now. Now, uh, while we talk about social interaction and things, what we have to, uh, aside from this hadith, there are three interesting ahadith in Sahih Muslim. All of them say something very similar and we have to cover it because it's uh, something you should know about, especially uh, because they're in Sahih Muslim again, including the hadith I mentioned to you before, Sahih Muslim. So if you just reading books like Sahih Muslim, you have to be very careful in interpretation and what you take from it. And this is why we had young people in Dawah in the 80s and 90s who used to run around and learn a few hadith because perhaps they'd be just flicking through Sahih Muslim come across and say, Ya we have to do this and come and say da, blah 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 blah. No understanding, no usul, no, had, uh, no other hadith, no Quran, no seerah, nothing, you know, just pick a few hadith. And I, I remember in the 80s debating with one of the uh, groups and their leader who used to say, well, if you come across the beast, brother, should, if she's authentic, shouldn't you follow it as soon as you realize it? Well, I said, it depends in the 80s. This is my discussion. So it depends. It's not as simple as that. It depends on what other ahadith are on that issue. Depends on if Muhaddafin has said it's authentic before you decide it's authentic. Depends on what the Quran says. So there's a lot more to it than just saying, I pick up hadith, I come across it and I start practicing it. <laughs> yeah, it's often, often not possible to do that. It needs understanding. Um, so these, there are three hadiths saying something similar. And uh, a fourth one in Ibn Majah. So the Christian came to one of my colleagues and said, you guys, and I mentioned this, but you guys say that you don't believe in sin being transferred from one to the other and we believe in the original sin and we have to go through Jesus Christ etc but you guys say no no everybody carries their own burden of sin and it can't be transferred but what about this you've seen your traditions in in book of Muslim that your prophet is saying follow us <clears throat> that he's saying that on the day of judgment um, and this is uh, Sahih Muslim 6668 uh, and Abi Burda and Abihi. Abi Burda, the Stabihi, is father of Abu Musa al Ashari. Uh, and in the Bihi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yaji Yom al Qayama, Nasum min al Muslimi. On the day of judgment, people will come from the Muslims, Bidunu Amsal Jibal, with sins like mountains on their backs. Okay? 
فَيَغْفِرُهَا اللَّهُ لَهُمْ وَيَدْعُوهَا عَلَى الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارِ So Allah will forgive them and He will take those mountains of sins and put them on the Jews and the Christians. Uh, uh, the, the, what the reporter says, فِيمَا أَحْسَبُ أَنَا I think it's something similar to this. So he's got a question mark, one of the reporters. It's not clear which reporter it is, says. I think it was something like that. So they're not sure about the words as well. So that's, a, that's something that muhaddith look out for when they say something like that. <laughs> yeah. Now then, and other similar hadith that came uh, again in Sahih Muslim, just before it. لا يموت رجل مسلم إلا أدخل الله مكانه النار يهوديا أو نصرانيا. Yeah, saying no person from the Muslim dies except that Allah enters in his place in the fire a Christian or a Jew or a Jew or a Christian. Similar meaning to that one. So the sins are being transferred. So they're saying, what kind of justice is that? You know. You talk about sins, and here's sins being, being put on us. Yeah? Uh, and uh, any Muslim coming along, whatever kind of life they've lived, that's the impression you get, isn't it? If a Muslim is coming with a mountain of sins, what kind of Muslim do you think they are? Yeah? All the ones around us, majority, yeah? Yeah, the worst ones. And they're getting scot free into paradise. You can see. You can understand the objection of the Christian. I can understand it, can't I can understand, look, I'm looking at a hadith, I'm in shock. When I first came across the hadith many years ago, this can't be right. Sai Muslim, what do I do with it? So it needs, it needs learning and sitting with scholarship and to try and understand what's actually going on and look at what other scholars said in the past. Now, Imam Muslim is one of the best muhaddithin. There's no doubt about that. Not as good as Imam Bukhari, if you look at the level. All the Ummahs agreed with that. In critique of Hadith. Nevertheless, there are many Muhaddithin who came after them, and many some who were before them as well. Yeah. Some who were similar level to them who came after them. Imam Zahabi, Abdar Qutni, who came later, a few hundred years later. Ibn Hajar, for example, great Muhaddith as well, who came later, of a brilliant level as well. So they, look, they, they also have comments about of course, the reality is that Imam Muslim is still a human being. Can he make mistakes? Yes, he can. Yes. Yeah, uh, and uh, this is the issue here. Now, the first of these I mentioned to you uh, has a, a reporter in it called Shaddad. A Zahabi, also a great muhaddith and great alim scholar, a few hundred years after uh, Imam Muslim, said that Shaddad is weak. He's a weak reporter. He often reports reports which are munkar. Munkar means they are rejected. They're against against other reports or the Quran. They're called munkar, yeah. uh, meaning single which are rejected. So Zahabi criticizes him in relation to this. Ibn Hajar took this hadith and others. So Ibn Hajar says in his Ibn Hajar is very famous al Asqalani as a muhaddith. The uh, one who did the Fatul Bari, which is the explanation of Sahih al Bukhari, yeah, the whole of Sahih al Bukhari. So Ibn Hajar says, uh, that Ibn Hajar says that this hadith, the first one of Shaddad, it is, um, it is weak. It is weak. It is not authentic. He rejects it being authentic. He also says that al Bayhaqi had also said it was weak. Bayhaqi is another muhaddith. And saying same thing that Shaddad, one of the reporters, brings Munkar Hadith, rejected Hadith. So we have to be careful. Ibn Hajar says that there are other reports, and I mentioned the other report to you, which doesn't mention the mountain, it just mentions that Muslims will come and their place in fire will be taken by the Christian and the Jew. So Ibn Hajar is mentioning saying, because there's three Hadith. Yeah. 
There's three of them. All saying the same kind of thing. So Ibn Hajar says, even though the other reports of this hadith with other chains, these are Al-Bayhaqi, Al-Bayhaqi, Ibn Hajar rejects them. Ibn Hajar says, Imam Bukhari, Imam Bukhari saw them as weak. Imam Bukhari saw them as weak and said, Imam Bukhari's argument in this issue, he said, the hadith, the ahadith to do with a shafa'ah of Rasulullah are more authentic. So the ulama say, when Bukhari makes that statement, he means these Sahih Muslim hadith are, are weakened, they're more authentic because Imam Bukhari is arguing, then if Muslims with mountains of sin come on the Day of Judgment and automatically their sins are transferred to Jews and Christians and they're put in the fire, what happens to the Shafa of Nabi وسلم, which came in Mutawatir Hadith? See Imam Bukhari's argument. So Imam Bukhari says these Hadith cannot be right yeah, because even Muslims who've done bad deeds, yeah, they believe in Allah. We believe in the Shafa. The way out is Shafa of Rasulullah. Not that the sins are put on others like Jews and Christians. Yeah. Imam Bukhari is saying the same thing. Al Bayhaqi goes on further, quite rightly so, and uses the Quran on top of all these comments and says, Allah says, Wala taziru wa wuzra ukhra. No person will bear the burdens of another soul. This rejects this hadith. This is Quran. It's a very clear statement. Yeah, very clear, direct, and in understanding. No burden of sins will be uh, taken. Uh, no other person will take the burdens of another, another. Which is what our belief is. Yeah. So, this is the way to understand this hadith. I believe these hadith are not authentic. And an indication for it is also in one of the hadith. Because in one of the hadith, Sahih Muslim mentions that this hadith is mentioned by Abi Burda to Omar bin Abdul Aziz. You know Omar bin Abdul Aziz? Came just a few generations, a couple of generations perhaps, uh, two or three generations after uh, Khulafa Rashid, after Ali radiallahu yeah. anhu. So uh, he's from the family of Omar as well, radiallahu anhu, Omar ibn Khattab. This is, they say the second Omar. Yeah. And majority ulama are the opinion that he was also from Khulafa Rashid, the attribute. So this is the reign of Omar bin Abdul Aziz. He was a great, pious Khalif. And his uh, reign was only for a short period, but he tried to reform back to the ways of the pious uh, Khalif before. So it's mentioned to him. Abu Burda mentioned this hadith to him. Right? In Sahih Muslim it says, what does he say? Omar bin Abdul Aziz says to Abu Burda, swear three times that you heard your father say this from the Messenger of Allah. Swear three. Why does he say swear three times? He doesn't like that. It's quite, you get an indication from what he's saying that he doesn't like the meaning of this. And in the other one, one of the reports I said to you saying, I think it's something like that. Not sure. And now Omar bin Abdul Aziz is not happy. So he's making Abu Burda, the Tabi, he swear, take an oath by Allah that that is true. Yeah, he swore three times, but it doesn't say the rest of the report whether Umar bin Abdul Aziz still accepted it or didn't accept it. In fact, Imam Bukhari mentioned in Tariq al Kabir about this incident as well. Not in his Sahih Bukhari, in Tariq al Kabir, where he discusses reporters, etc., whether we rely on them or not. And Imam Bukhari says, that Amr bin Abdul Aziz also asked Abi Burda, how old are you now? And he was 80 years of age. Mm -hmm. So they're indicating that he's become senile and not remembering so well. That's why he asked him his age. You understand? So these are all indications, yeah, which help us to, uh, to support the idea that this is not authentic and against the Quran, actually. Now, an interesting one, uh, um, is another hadith I said in Ibn Majah. 
and I'm not going to get a chance to start the topic of jihad, which I'll do next time, so I want to uh, mention this. This is a report uh, which is mentioned by Ibn Majah that Abu Mama said, Allah be pleased with you, that the Messenger of Allah said on whom the Prophet uh, None is made, alaykum as none is made to enter paradise by Allah Most High, except Allah Most High shall marry him to 72 wives. Two of them from the wide-eyed maidens of paradise, who reign. And 70 of them from his inheritance from the people of hellfire. Not one of them, but her attraction will never wane. You'll always be attracted to her. And his arousal for her will never diminish. So this is in al Bayhaqi Ibn Majah. Now, so the Christian priest, he goes, so you took us all into hellfire with your sins, and then you take our, our women, you take who are beautiful out 70 a time to marry yourself and take them into paradise. What kind of justice is, see how he's interpreting this, saying, well, this is in your books. And it is. It is. So 70 of them, just because you feel like to have sexual relationship with them, you've taken them out of hellfire of our women. And you see he's got a point again. This hadith is uh, definitely not authentic. It is fabricated and bottled. But unless you've studied Hadith books and studied with scholars of Hadith, you won't know that. It's in Ibn Majah. Ibn Majah, people, Muslim arm, see Ibn Majah as one of the six authentic books. But actually Ibn Majah is the weakest of the six authentic books. And this title, Seha Sitta, is very misleading anyway. Yeah, very misleading. Because only Imam Bukhari and Muslim put the criteria that they were going to collect the most authentic or authentic hadith. Abi Dawood never said, I'm only going to collect authentic hadith. Neither did an Nasai, neither did Tirmidhi. In fact, Tirmidhi, in many of the hadith, he's giving you his opinion. This is authentic, this is, this is uh, okay, this is not authentic. Tirmidhi is giving you that. So he never said, I'm going to, this is called Sahih Sunan as many people call them. So, Ibn Majah never said that either. And he doesn't even clarify, is it authentic or not? He's collected them. Therefore, other ulama who came, muhaddithin, were very critical of Ibn Majah and said, be careful, because there, there are many authentic in it as well, which you can find in the other books. But there are others which are, uh, a large number which are weakened and fabricated as well. So be careful. This is Ibn Majah. And... Uh, it is uh, fabricated. So, the answer to the any Christian, well, this is not right. This is not correct. And just to finish off with, of course, famously from this comes the issue of 70 virgins. Um, and uh, we thought, we need to investigate. That is always passed around Google, isn't it? And lots of Islamic things it's on. And of course, Orientalists and non-Muslims are always pointing this out. He's after the 70 virgins in paradise, etc. So we looked at all this, uh, ahadith, uh, in our research. Uh, and to summarize this to you, that there is absolutely no authentic hadith that mention, mentions about being married to 70 virgins. There is no authentic hadith. There is a mention clearly in the Quran of virgins, hurul ain, yeah, wide eyed uh, hur who are described that no man or jinn had ever touched them. Yeah. Yeah. So they're described as being virgin. Now, on Hurrain, there's a big debate amongst ulama as to who they are. Yeah. There's nothing about how many you'll get in paradise. Even though it describes them as numbers there, it doesn't say how many you'll have. The most authentic that's found in Bukhari Muslim about being entered in paradise, which is authentic at these, that each believer will have two wives. Two wives. And then uh, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in Bukhari Muslim how beautiful they'll be. Uh, and therefore, there are ulama who said that, because women often say, well, who reign for the men? What about for the women? And ulama who said, be just because it's not mentioned doesn't mean there's no partners for the women. There is. Quran mentions, Lahum azwajum mutahharatun fiha. They'll have partners who are pure. 
meaning men and women will have partners. Yeah? So men for women and women. It's just that the men have not been described. So some ulama very nicely said that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps something hidden, doesn't describe it, it's even better than what is actually described. The reality of Jannah, of course, Abdullah Masood said from the Prophet Sallallahu yeah, in Jannah is that which no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no mind has ever imagined. There you are. Yeah. So the reality is for women as well, it's not just that uh, men are getting uh, beautiful. Yeah. There are some ulama even said that the Huru uh, Ain, wide eyed maidens of paradise, are actually the believing and good women and chaste women of this world. They become Huru Ain. That's an opinion as well among Salama. Anyway, uh, just to finish with that, that this 70 virgin, you can, I'm going to say, put it to bed. But it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can put it to bed. It is not based on any authentic hadith. Uh, any hadith to do with it is, uh, is uh, very weak, not accepted, uh, although some scholars uh, accepted uh, the 70 virgin hadith as being, with, uh, 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 as being uh, okay. Uh, okay, next time inshallah, because we're coming on to um, um, uh, Badr, Ghazwa and Sariya, we will talk about jihad first, inshallah, and uh, what, is, uh, what is its meaning and the difference for those who say there is offensive and defensive jihad, what is jihad? What, what is it in relation to Qital? What kinds of jihad there are on that issue, inshallah? Any questions for from today's what we covered? Uh, you just said uh, the hadith in Bukhari the Muslim, they are authentic. I didn't say that. No? <laughs> uh, I didn't say that. I'm um, sorry that I got the impression that you said they, the Imam Bukhari collected the authentic. They tried to collect that which was authentic. I didn't say they were all authentic. So there, there are some which... In Muslim? Yeah. Especially, yes. Especially we just came across some before you came in. But in, uh, in Bukhari, where he narrates a hadith with a full chain, yeah, some muhaddithin and ulama said there are no non-authentic hadith in Bukhari which are narrated because sometimes he mentions without a chain. He just mentioned it for information. <clears throat> he doesn't necessarily think they are as authentic. I, I think out of all the six books, Bukhari and Muslim are the most Absolutely. authentic. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Whether they're authentic or not, I don't think it's a layman that can... Absolutely. I'm not talking as a layman no, to you. Exactly. Okay? I'm trying to clarify we to you. We can't just read it and say, right, that's... My point, if you've been to my previous talks, is I'm saying that you can't just go to Bukhari and Muslim and start deciding for yourself. No. Interpretation, never mind authenticity.